This morning we are looking at the fourth in our current series of the seven last words of Jesus. The seven last things that he said from the cross before his death. We've already considered forgiveness as those who crucified him gambled for his possessions. We've thought about the faith shown by the criminal who hung alongside him and Jesus' offer of a place in paradise. We've thought about Christ's own concern for the well-being of his mother, that she is cared for spiritually as well as physically, and how this shows us some of the priorities of God. At each step, we've thought about how significant Jesus' words from the cross were, how they show us the heart of our God, that Jesus, even in his own agony, sought to forgive, to care, to save. And today we're thinking about those words that Pamela read to us from Mark 15. The only words from the cross that Mark records. Easily the most harrowing, the most disturbing, I think. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's set the scene a little. The cross was a cruel, cruel punishment. Deliberately designed to last. People would hang for days in agony, there for all to see, a deterrent to others who might think about crossing the Roman rulers of the land. But Jesus is not just crucified. First, he is flogged. And the Romans used flogging as a punishment for all sorts of crimes, but it was incredibly gruesome. It it was so bad that Roman citizens themselves were protected from flogging except in the most extraordinary circumstances. The Bible doesn't elaborate on the beating that Jesus took, but we know from Roman sources that this process was so bad it was known to strip away the flesh from a person and expose bone. It was brutal and it was not uncommon for people to die from such a beating. This is why uh, Jesus struggles to carry his cross in the same way those who were crucified alongside him did. Someone else has to carry it the rest of the way. He has almost certainly lost a lot of blood. And this is why instead of hanging there for days, Jesus is very close to death after just six hours. After three of those hours hanging in agony, the sky turns black. And this is no normal eclipse, as some has suggested. It comes at completely the wrong time of the month. It brings to mind the prophecy of Amos. In that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son at the end of a bitter day. There is something deeply profound about the deep darkness in the middle of the day. It turns our minds to these words of Amos, to thoughts of judgment and doom. And for three hours this persists until Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just before his death. And to be forsaken, it means to be separated, it means to be abandoned, it means to be deserted. There on the cross, Jesus feels these things, abandoned, alone in his time of deepest need. His disciples have fled, all but a few, and he feels forsaken by God. This is a God, let me remind you, who promises his people, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And yet Jesus Christ seems to put lie to that promise. There is something deeply, profoundly wrong going on here. Something deeply disturbing. And I mean that. I find this cry disturbing. It does the opposite of bring peace to my heart. This cry, it stirs up something within me. An unpleasant feeling. A wrongness. And that's because this cry of Christ represents something fundamentally wrong in our universe, in all of creation. Something profoundly wrong. Something is not as it should be. Something is not as it is meant to be. Jesus dies there on the cross, forsaken. Let's talk about that a little. 
Maybe let's start with how things should be. In the beginning, God, right? In the beginning, God. And what do we know of God in the beginning? We know that the word, according to John 1, Jesus, who he calls the word of God, was with God in the beginning. That all things that have been made were made through him. So in the beginning, God, Father and Son. And Genesis 1 verse 2 tells us that the Spirit of God hovers over the waters. And so in the beginning, God, Father, Son and Spirit. Our God is one God, the mighty I am, first and last, all powerful creator. And our God, who is one God, is also three, Father, Son and Spirit. One God, three persons. This is the profound mystery at the heart of our faith. Scholars and preachers, men and women of God alike have sought to explain the mystery that is the Trinity. And whilst we can grasp at the edges of it, we cannot fully understand it. But there it is. And God is love. The Bible tells us that. The Trinity, Father loves the Son, loves the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Father, loves the Son, vice versa. God exists in a state of love within himself. And when God made us women and men in his image, he made us to love as well, just like he loves. He made us to love him and to love one another. This is what it means to be made in the image of God. It means that each and every one of us were designed to have relationships that are characterised by love. Just like God, just like Father loves Son, loves Spirit. With me so far? The Bible tells us that God is eternal, that he has always been. Before there was time to measure, there was God. And after time has any meaning at all, there will still be God. God is eternal. And so Jesus, God the Son, Before he came to this world as a little baby on the first Christmas, he had always been. For the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years since creation. And even before that, Jesus had always been and he had always been in a loving relationship with the Father and the Spirit. As they had with him. And after the cross... After Jesus died for the sins of the world, after he had set things right by his own death, that relationship, that deeply profound loving relationship between Spirit, Son and Father will once more stretch on into forever. This is normal. This is the way things should be. This is the foundations on which the world is created. God who is three. A loving relationship within God. This is the foundation of all creation. It is good and it is right. And so as Jesus cries out, something is deeply wrong. As Jesus cries out, there is something deeply wrong at the heart of the Trinity, at the centre of all there is. The Son is forsaken by the Father. The eternal relationship of love is somehow broken, damaged, torn apart. Some of us may have a sense of some just small part of this. From our own experience, we know a little of what that's like. Because we know what it's like to lose someone with whom we have had an intimate loving relationship. We know the pain of separation. And even though we know, many of us as people of God, that we may be united once more with those we love when our Lord calls us home. It doesn't make the pain go away. We know that pain of losing someone we have loved for decades. This pain was just like that experience on the cross. Only Jesus' experience was a hundredfold, a thousandfold worse because the relationship between Father and Son and Spirit is more intimate than we can imagine, has been in place longer than we can imagine. 
When we talk about Jesus suffering for us, the most profound suffering he experienced was not the beating, was not the nails through his hands and feet. It was not the crown of thorns on his head or the slow suffocation on the cross. The most profound suffering Christ experienced was the separation he felt from God. The God forsakenness of that moment. The break in that most intimate of loving relationships. And so Jesus cries out. This is not one of those moments when Jesus goes aside to spend some time alone with God. Some private prayer between father and son. Jesus cries out for all to hear. Elsewhere in the Bible, when Jesus talks to God directly, he calls him father. Abba is the word. Daddy or something like it, only with something more. Abba is about intimacy and respect, obedience. Abba, Jesus says normally as he addresses the father, but not here. Here that intimacy has been lost. The relationship is broken. Here he cries, my God, as if to one he does not know, a distant God whom he cannot feel close to him. Jesus uses that first line of Psalm 22. Let me read you the next few. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. My heart breaks at this cry and the depth of the wrongness of the separation of son from father, the wrongness of a broken relationship within God. So what on earth is going on and why is it happening? Pamela has another reading for us this morning, which I hope will help us think about it. Our reading comes from Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 to 8. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. Your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments and speak lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats the eggs will die. And when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. This is what happened in what we sometimes call the fall. It is the consequence of what we call sin, separation from God. We were made to love. We were made to have a loving relationship with God and with each other. And part of that involves continuing to live according to the way God designed us to live. Sin is when we choose differently, when we choose our own way to live our own way rather than how God made us to live. Our own way, our sinful way, which all too often hurts others, hurts ourselves and hurts God. Our sins, our iniquities, as Isaiah calls them, have separated us from the loving relationship we should have with our creator and have made it difficult for us to have a proper relationship with each other too. And if you're thinking, I'm not such a bad person, I'm not full of iniquity, just think about some of those things Isaiah mentioned. He talks about lies and wicked talk. He talks about violence. But he also condemns people for not speaking up for justice. 
The reality is that none of us are perfect. All of us have made choices that we know are wrong. We have done things which hurt one another and which hurt God. We have done things both through our actions and our inaction. And it has separated us from God. Our sins have broken the most important relationship in the world, the one we were designed for. You were made in the image of God to have a loving relationship with him, and yet you cannot. Human sin, of which we all take a part, has turned God's perfect creation into something far less than it should be. Right, here's a terrible analogy. And it's a little lighthearted when we're talking about something so profound, but bear with me. This whole thing is like not having Wi-Fi, right? I said you need to bear with me. Now, some of you are thinking that not having Wi-Fi is not so bad because you've lived most of your life for, uh, for many years without it. You can go days or weeks or months without Wi-Fi and it doesn't bother you. Some of you have never even had Wi-Fi and you don't care. Well, let me tell you, you don't know what you're missing. Wi-Fi means that you can get any radio show, any TV show, whenever you want it. It means you can communicate with just about anyone else instantly. Wi-Fi means all the information and entertainment in the world at your fingertips. Wi-Fi is wonderful. And so our separation from God is like not having Wi-Fi. It's like not being connected to the Internet and all it has to offer. Many of us, maybe we don't miss it so much because we've never been connected. We don't really know what it's like to be connected. Don't make the most of it when we have it. For so many people on this planet, it is also true that they do not know what it's like to be connected to God. They don't know what it's like to have a proper loving relationship with him. We don't know what it's like to live as we were created to live. But the promise of the cross is that this relationship will be mended. And we'll get there in a moment. Our connection will be re-established. We'll get Wi-Fi again forever. Or maybe like getting Wi-Fi for the first time. Anything you can imagine right there. Now, the key to this analogy is that Jesus has always had good Wi-Fi. His connection to God has always been spot on. Like a child born in the year 2000 has always had good Wi-Fi. There's never been a time that child didn't have entertainment and information right there always to hand. They have never known what it's like to have to wait for something to come on the radio or the TV in order to enjoy it. To buy a newspaper to know what's going on. They've always had it. And for them, losing the signal, the Wi-Fi dropping out is the most devastating thing that can happen. Because they know what they're missing. This is the difference between Jesus and us. For Jesus, the pain of separation from the love of God is so much more profound on that cross in that moment because he knows what he has lost. He knows the joy of intimacy with the Father and he hangs there and he cries, why have you forsaken me? And what separates the Son from the Father as he hangs there on the cross is not his own sin, it's not the things that Jesus has done wrong that leaves him forsaken. It is our sin. It is yours and mine and everyone else's. There on the cross, he bore our sins and all the consequences of them. Separation from God. He took our broken relationships on so that it could be repaired, so that he could repair it. This is what Paul says about it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. We've got Wi-Fi. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God made him who had no sin be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus chose to go to the cross to reconcile all of humanity with God. He bore our sins. He bore the pain of separation so that those who believe in him might have eternal life in the presence of the father. 
so that all might have the chance to live as we were designed to live. Jesus forsaken us on the cross. It wasn't about the father no longer being there. The father was still there. The forsakenness was the lack of intimacy between father and son caused by our sin. And Jesus, by his death and resurrection, has dealt with that division. He's reset the Wi-Fi hub. He has made a way between creation and creator. He has restored what was broken. By that deep, profound wrongness, God forsakenness, he has set things right. The consequence of sin is eternal separation from the God who made us to love and to be loved. The rewards of faith in Christ is eternal connectedness with him. Jesus endured the cross for you and for me that we might receive this reward rather than that consequence. He endured something that was profoundly wrong and disturbing in order to set things right. This is our God. This is the love of God. He has opened the way. How will you respond to that today?